guys, thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm Karen, I lead a department at AT&T called Hello Lab. And in the boardroom, I would say we develop original programs that drive meaningful KPIs for millennials and Generation Z. And on the street, I guess I'd say we make <laughs> shit that youngs care about. And or try. Um, <laughs> we, we try. Um, so we get the opportunity to uh, manage a lot of exciting programs. Um, we steer a partnership with Taylor Swift, uh, Reese Witherspoon. We're working with Jennifer Lopez right now. Um, we have an annual partnership with iHeart where we activate at their concerts. And uh, today we're here to talk about our partnership with Fullscreen that has um, spanned many years and is so important for us to hit those meaningful KPIs. <laughs> and as part of that partnership, one of the things that we've been doing is trying to create content for young people, for younger millennials and Gen Z. And when we create this content, we're not just trying to advertise for the brand. We really stake in ourselves to do something good. That's something that's important to AT&T and something important to us at full screen. And one of the things that we discovered in doing research about this younger generation is that we found that bullying had definitely changed since the days when I was younger and getting picked on from every hot girl in my high school around. <laughs> the thing that is true about bullying today is that it's not part of the teenage experience. It's actually central to the teenage experience. In fact, about 160,000 teenagers every day skip school because they're being bullied just in the US here. One in 10 students drop out of school and change to a different school because they're being bullied. And in fact, we've been seeing rising rates of depression and teen suicide, so much to the point that the CDC actually called it a national epidemic. So we wanted to make sure that we were doing something that could truly give back to this community that we were kind of trying to connect with and service them. And we worked with AT&T on that. Can we have a one clap moment? If you went to high school and social media didn't exist, let's hear it. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done, and I'm so glad I didn't live through that. Um, I came from Vine, I worked at Twitter, and, um, and I was working very closely there uh, with the engineers to build a lot of tools for Vine stars and other people who use the platform to be able to combat cyberbullying. So I spent a, a year first person reading all of these comments and they are horrifying. Um, I think what happens is young kids who don't feel a sense of power in their world come home after school and they just release all of that rage onto the internet as anonymous voices and it translate, translates into a lot of hate being spread. So I was so happy to come to AT&T and um, hear our CEO, Randall Stevenson, say, I'm just going to read this to make sure I quote him correctly, <laughs> that AT&T has always been about harnessing the power of our network to change lives and improve the world. So our um, efforts and energies really dovetailed nicely. We worked with the corporate social responsibility team and launched a campaign called Later Haters to give young people the tools that they need to squash cyberbullying. And Later Haters is a great thing because it gives all of the individuals tools. But one of the things that we realized in researching bullying and cyberbullying is that what bullies do is they isolate their victims. They really operate in this mentality where they identify you, they isolate you, and they send you these direct messages so that all of a sudden you feel as if you are separate from your community. Then their next tactic is after their victim is often isolated, they take this role of saying everyone feels like this. So they utilize the community against the individual. So instead of taking a typical kind of PSA route where we were trying to connect with the individuals about you know, whether they were being bullied or um, you know, if they were the bullies to kind of guilt them out of that, we wanted to try to take a different route, which was to really create a community where the kids could come and have a safe space to learn tactics from each other and to be inspired to not participate in cyberbullying. But that also posed a challenge for us. How do you create community with a group of teenagers that are not connected? They don't sit together every day, they're not in the hallways, and they're not in the same lunchroom. So in doing research, one trend that we identified was that they truly are connecting over these new entertainment experiences. So we decided to try to create together a community around an interactive entertainment experience that could be bringing them in and making them participate in this movement. So, of course, every decision that we make is based in data. We know that 83% of millennials feel that brands deserve their loyalty when those brands put a concerted effort into improving their communities. 
that really built our case uh, for moving forward with this project. And we selected an amazing ensemble cast of uh, digital creators who have a combined footprint of 38 million. Um, also, uh, data points to the fact that most young people are using some type of ad blocker. So they're not likely to see a message that a brand delivers to them, but they follow all of these guys. And so we brought them together. We always approach working with digital creators from a win-win perspective. Um, so we talked to each one of these guys as we were developing the creative for this show. Uh, Miles McKenna, for example, is trans. And his dream was to be cast in a show where he was trans, but that wasn't part of the storyline. It was just a normal experience. And so um, he got his wish on this, and, and every person who is in this cast um, had a part in building their character and their lines so that it felt very organic, not only to them personally, but to the audience that they speak to on a daily basis. I think another really important part about empowering digital creators is to treat them as legitimate actors. Um, you know, we have to think about this new world that we're living in. Actors used to be hired and hit their marks and they were given a script and hair and makeup and cameramen and directors. These kids have become famous by sitting in their bedrooms, coming up with all of their own ideas, building their brand, making all of their creative decisions, we have to lean into them and understand that that is an art and a talent to be respected. And so what we're gonna show you with the show that we worked with them to create, which is an interactive scripted story um, that is based around a mystery of who stole this diary that kind of had this girl have a freak out and turned her into a viral meme in which she disappeared from society because she was hiding from being famous. So this is the trailer for that. As you can see, and as I try to change to the next channel, the next slide, as you can see, it looks a lot and feels a lot like traditional YA TV. It's a storyline that potentially you've even seen before. It's a mystery. But one of the things that we wanted to do was not just build any show. We wanted to make sure that Guilty Party truly built a community. And to do that, we wanted to make sure that we were playing around with a narrative could be in the digital era, that we weren't just making something that we were translating for the digital era. So to do this, we really started to research and try to understand the youth audience and these digital natives and how they were engaging with you know, different kind of entertaining experiences for them. One of the things that we identified, actually I just realized I went too far, one of the things that we identified is a key trend was this trend within young people that they actually, because of social media, have increasingly started to see their friends of entertainment. Think about it, if you have a moment of downtime, you're just as likely to look at what the Kardashians are doing as what your best friend is doing off in another city with some other friends of yours as well, too. But the thing that's interesting about that for us in this room is that that has made it so that they increasingly expect that their entertainment behaves as friends. We call this trend friend entertainment. And one of the things upon identifying this trend is we decided to try to create a show in which it wasn't necessarily that the show was playing out in episodes, that the show was actually an entertainment experience as if it was happening to them and they were in that group of friends. What this meant for us was that we actually had the show have typical episodes, but in addition to that, we also had the different characters, they did video diaries that they, pr they put up and they talked about their experience. They were kind of play blaming each other, almost like a game of mafia that the audience could participate. Additionally, we had them engage on social media and Instagram. We scripted out the comments so that actually the story continued in the, in the YouTube comments. And in addition to that, every time we posted a video, we had a writer's room that went live in the characters and interacted directly with the audience as if they were part of the school that was experiencing this phenomenon as well. Um, another trend that we identified in trying to reconstruct what narrative could be was this concept that these digital natives have actually grown up in a completely different way from us, which is they have always had the universe at their fingertips. Anything you say to a young person, if you try to tell them that it's a fact or anything like that, they are just as likely to look at you and go, okay, hold on, I'm going to Google that to make sure you're right. And because of that, they almost see themselves as amateur sleuths. So we wanted to design a show that allowed them to behave in that, in that kind of engagement way. So what we did is we actually um, kind of threw out the clues as far as we could into the internet. We hid them in places that they might be, but that they wouldn't know that our show was there, and tried to see if they would bring those clues back to us, much like the audience did when Serial was kind of participating. We also hid clues in DMs and hid clues in all of these different little spaces and tried to make them kind of the owner of solving the mystery as we went along so that they could really tap that amateur sleuth personality as well. 
Another thing that we saw with this young generation is that because they live online and offline, they're living often in this blurred reality. One of the things that's happening is their own life is almost becoming fictionalized. Because if you think about it, they're putting up these pictures, and then they're putting all these Instagram apps on it. They're writing the perfect caption. So they're constantly telling a fictional story about themselves and engaging fictional stories in their friends. So we wanted to see if we could not trick our audience in any way and pretend that this was a real thing that was happening, but if we could pull them in and kind of blur those lines further. As I mentioned earlier, one of the ways that we did that is by having the characters talk to them directly. We actually had an incident where one of the characters reveals that she's had an eating disorder the whole time, and we had fans writing these long comments to her saying, I'm so sorry I misjudged you, apologizing to our fictional characters that they knew were fictional. Another way that we did this is we actually hosted a real live event where we invited fans to come and cosplay as if they were students at the actual school itself. We created this whole school so that was an escape room and the kids could come into it, they registered, they got their ID card and everything like that and they went to the different rooms and they had to find out different clues that they could put together to kind of unlock the final piece of the story. We had the influencers there but they weren't playing, they weren't being influencers, they were in character so they were engaging directly in our, with our fans who were dressed up as students of the school that was a fictional story in character to solve this final mystery in an attempt to continue to blur the lines. So 10 weeks, 65 million views, 562 million impressions, uh, 285,000 followers built on a YouTube page that we had launched specifically for this series. Other social handles launched um, in other places and gained followers, 39 million engagements. Um, for me, the engagements that were the most meaningful were reading all of the comments, um, thanking AT&T. That's some really direct brand attribu attribution telling us that we get it, um, that they love uh, what we're doing and that they see that we're taking this really authentic approach to the community that they're so invested in. Um, also fan art. These kids made so much art and tweeted it out to our digital creators. Um, and it felt like we really all became a community. Many of the DMs and the chat rooms that we set up for the fans of this show are still talking today. They've built friendships with other kids um, across the country and it gives them a support system as they tackle cyberbullying and bullying in real life. It truly gives them that support system. I think one of the most meaningful moments for a lot of us was at that cosplaying event that we told you about. We had a young girl come up to us who was telling us that she grew up in a rural conservative Christian town and as a bisexual female, she had experienced so much bullying and so much pain. And that school had always been this really dangerous place for her. And she came up to us and she literally started to cry to us that this event was the first time she had ever been in a school environment and felt safe. And it was one of those moments where we knew that we hadn't just created a show and we hadn't just created advertising or an entertainment experience, but that we had started the tipping block of finishing or you know, helping kind of create a safe environment for young people where they can band together against bullying. So we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, we're building a new program around these learnings for this year uh, that include giving young people a direct line to text when they need some support and counselors um, so that we can continue to drive uh, this feeling of we hear you, we get it, we know it's tough. Um, and I'll leave you with three takeaways uh, that have meant a lot to me in working on this program. Uh, the first is if you're going to work on a campaign for young people, you need to staff your employee base with young people. <laughs> you need to be sure that you're not marketing from an ivory tower. Um, these kids are inherently diverse. They view gender and sexuality and so many other things that are hard for me to comprehend as a spectrum. Um, it is very hard for a room full of old white guys to even pretend what these kids are interested in. So I would challenge you to um, reach out, find some diversity, make sure that you're staffed for it. I realize that it's ironic given that we're two white girls standing on this stage, but um, you know there are too many white people in this room. We have got to do a better job of diversifying all points of view. Uh, secondly, 
I would recommend if you're working with influencers to build first person relationships with them. It's a much more meaningful campaign for everyone when they've been a part of the creative, when they know you personally, when they understand what you're looking for, they tend to also over deliver on their social contracts when they're truly invested in the project that they're working on. Um, and lastly, I would say if you can find an element of social good to layer into any of your programs, it's a win for everybody. It speaks very directly and authentically to this market, and it's personally really validating. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you.